Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And we've got a bunch of stuff to talk about today, including a little email I got about the Lily drone. I'll explain more about this in a minute if you uh, don't remember what that was. Uh, Apple Watch 4 has a great new feature that I wanted to talk about in this video. Uh, the inbox that we talked about last week about how I organize my emails, well, just as I was talking about it, Google got rid of it. We'll talk more about what's going to happen with inbox in a minute. Uh, I went to Silicon Valley early last week and I've got some photos to show you of my trip. I also am going to talk about proper disclosures for live streamers, given that some might be on for hours at a time. We'll look at what the rules are surrounding that. Uh, we'll also look at why YouTube has little competition and why I still think it's a good place to get started in your media career. And we'll also uh, talk a little bit about some progress Steam is making with uh, their Steam OS along with Linux support for Windows games. Lots to talk about now, so let's get to it. And before we begin, I want to thank our newest members here on the channel, including Too Much Sauce, who made a gold level contribution. We also have Slava Kali and James Parkin, who contributed via the new YouTube membership program. I'm going to start color coding these names so you know where they came from. We've got about four different ways now uh, people can support the channel. I want to thank everyone who contributed this week, along with everyone who contributes on an ongoing basis. I also want to thank everyone who watches on a regular basis, too, because all of those things, as I always say, equals channel growth. Now, we don't have an advertiser this week, but we do have a non-ad, an affiliate link for the HP Business Outlet. I've been poking around to see what major manufacturers have for closeouts and refurbished computers. And HP has something that they update every day. Uh, so they have a couple of things that you can click on here and buy directly. But below that is a list of all these major product categories that they change every single day with new stock. And when you see something in that list, uh, you got to call them to order it, but they're usually uh, very reasonably priced and usually come with a good warranty as well. It's always a neat place to check when you're in the market for a new computer because you can often get something uh, that's pretty much like new with a good warranty for far less than buying new. And you can see more at the link you see on screen. So let's take a look now at the week in review. We didn't have all that much up on the extras channel this week because I was traveling, but we did unbox the Acer Chromebook Tab 10 and I later reviewed that on the main channel. In fact, that video went up on Saturday night. We also had a review of the Samsung Go Mic Mobile, which is a pretty convenient way to get wireless microphones inputted into your smartphone. And we also looked at the CalDigit TS3 Plus Thunderbolt dock, which was a very complete dock if you're in the market for something higher end and have a Thunderbolt 3 computer, of course. You can see all of those videos linked down below in the master playlist. And now it's time for a couple of things in the news that caught my eye. And this email came in over the weekend to me that uh, I thought was pretty ridiculous. So you can see at the top here, it says, come back to Lily. Now, if you don't remember, the Lily drone was one of these crowdfunding projects that looked pretty cool at the time. This was a couple of years ago before the DJI drones were doing all this uh, follow you stuff. And basically uh, what it would have was a little sensor that you would put into your wrist or on your person somewhere. And this drone, which was waterproof, would follow you around and do some really cool uh, video of your activities. And that was pretty appealing. And I thought, you know, this might be something fun to review on the channel. So I went into their crowdfunding campaign, which incidentally, they were managing themselves, not through Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And I waited and waited and waited. And then I got something in my email saying they went bankrupt. Uh, and I had to file an official claim with the bankruptcy court, which wasn't hard to do, but nonetheless, I still had to make an official claim with the bankruptcy court to try to get my money back. Uh, surprisingly, I did get my money back through that process, but it took a very long time to recoup those dollars I had paid them a year or two before. Uh, but I, I guess what happened here is that the Moda Group, which is a drone manufacturer, purchased the assets of the former Lilly company, and they are rebrand, not even rebranding, they're actually just selling the brand again, which I think is really stupid. Uh, so they emailed all the backers saying, come on back to us, we're new, it's something different now, so give us your money again, and uh, no thanks. I think if you are uh, taking over a project that nearly burned all of its backers, uh, coming to them with the same brand name and saying, come back to us is probably not the best way to relaunch your product. This is not a uh, very well-loved brand here. And this version of it, 
uh, while it might incorporate some of the IP that they developed at the time, uh, does not appear to be waterproof, which was one of the major selling points of the drone that people were backing. And they're also trying to sweeten the deal here by offering you 100 shares of their company when they file their IPO. No, thank you. We're going to stay away from this one, but I thought that was just kind of funny to see that. Uh, the other big news, of course, is Apple with their new iPhone XS and their new Apple Watch. Uh, there's also the iPhone XR, which is a lower cost version of the 10. I am not going to upgrade this year. I usually upgrade my phone every year, uh, but I'm not seeing any need to do so. I just got a new phone, of course, after my other one uh, got dropped and the screen broke. And as you can see, I have it in a case now. Um, so I'm very, very happy with the performance on this one. Uh, the new phones really don't seem to be doing anything more than the current generation do. There's just really nothing new here beyond maybe some improvements to the camera, which are, I think, good but marginal and certainly not worth a full upgrade here. So I think the smartphone industry has kind of hit its maturity point. We saw that with the PC industry, too. I used to upgrade my computers every year, too. Not anymore. Uh, so I think we're going to be uh, all pretty satisfied with our phones for at least the next two or three years. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure when I'm going to need to upgrade my phone again. This one seems to be more than adequate uh, for everything that I do. And again, I just don't see it. So we'll have to see what Apple and other uh, competitors cook up in the future to try to get us to keep parting with our money. But for now, I think we've hit the crescendo here on smartphone development. But I was pleased about the announced update to the Apple Watch. And of course, you all see me wearing the Apple Watch all the time. Uh, this is the original Apple Watch that I bought way back in 2015, so I'm definitely ready for an upgrade. It's really slow. A lot of the things that I do with the watch, including uh, doing a lot of home kit control for my door locks and lights and everything, those Siri commands take forever on this. I bought my wife a Series 3 watch uh, last holiday season, and hers is a lot faster, and apparently these watches are even faster than that. But the big difference, I think, that uh, Apple has added to this new product is the uh, ECG feature, which will uh, take a look at your heart rhythm. And that is a significant thing for a, a lot of folks out there because given just how uh, ubiquitous the Apple Watch has been is becoming, as we mentioned and talked about last week on the channel, uh, there's a lot of these watches out there. And there's a lot of people who uh, have a heart condition called AFib and don't know they have it. And this condition, if not treated, uh, dramatically increases your stroke risk. And what AFib means is that your heart uh, beats out of rhythm. And in the course of beating out of rhythm, your blood pools up in portions of your body, sometimes within the heart itself, and develops clots that then get through the bloodstream, go to your head and cause a stroke. And it can happen to people who are young or middle-aged, as well as those who are much older. And knowing you have AFib uh, is a, a important step to getting treated and preventing these strokes from happening. It is a treatable condition, and it's a condition actually that I have. I don't have a serious case of it yet. I have what they call a paraaxial uh, AFib, which is a, just an occasional thing. But about a year and a half, two years ago, I was um, lifting my daughter up in the air, and what I've had for my, most of my life is a little uh, thump that I would feel my heart just kind of beat out of rhythm for a second and then go back to normal. My grandfather had it, uh, my father has it, uh, and they all passed it down to me. And thankfully, this at the moment is not a regular condition, but happens from time to time. And when I lifted my daughter up that one time, right before my 39th birthday, it knocked my heart out of rhythm. It was beating at a very, very rapid pace. I had to go to the emergency room. Thankfully, they didn't have to shock me, which is the usual uh, way to get the heart back in line. They just pumped me up with an IV and let me rest for a little bit, and it got back to normal. Thankfully, I haven't had that happen since, but I have gone to a cardiologist, and I got my full workup here, so my, my heart is fine. Uh, it's just this is something that I'm just going to have to deal with, and right now, thankfully, it's nothing uh, that is going to cause any immediate issues. But what's nice about having this feature on the watch is that I can take a heart rhythm uh, anywhere. So if I'm feeling like maybe something's going on, I can go ahead and just uh, take the watch out, put my finger on the, uh, the little crown of the watch and get a reading that's good enough to know whether or not I should go in and get checked out. I'm fortunate that when I have one of these things, I can feel it. But for a lot of people with AFib, they don't even know they have it. And that is really the biggest frightening thing out there. Uh, for people with my condition, which is occasional, the older I get, the more frequent it's likely to become. So I'll probably go from being just a once in a while AFib person to somebody that will have it more frequently. And I think it's just really important to have this built into a device that 
uh, is very convenient and available to you. Now, reading heart rhythm is different than reading heart rate, and therefore they have added a new sensor to the watch on the bottom uh, with an electrode, and you complete the electrical circuit, which is basically just the circuit within your body, uh, by touching the crown of the watch. So you've got a completed circuit going through both arms, and that's how it's able to read what your heart rhythm is based on the electrical impulses uh, from your body, and that is, uh, again, very different than just reading heart rate, which these watches typically do with an optical sensor. Um, so it probably won't be as accurate as what you might have at the doctor's office with all the other sensors they attach to you, but it's going to be good enough to know whether or not you need to go and get one of those examinations versus just uh, continuing about your day, and it's nice to see that. But as a result of the fact that you have to complete that circuit, uh, the watch is not going to be looking at your heart rhythm randomly throughout the day as it does with heart rate. So if you get a warning that your heart rate is kind of irregular, uh, then go ahead and run that and see if you're having a rhythm problem, and that I think will uh, give you some better insight. But I, I'm telling you, I know there's going to be a lot of people who get this watch and uh, do one of those ECGs and realize they have a very serious medical condition that they didn't feel and didn't know they had and might go a long way to improving their quality of life and saving them from a debilitating stroke or worse death. And this is really uh, great to see that on here. Now, this is not the first product to offer you a portable ECG mechanism, but it's probably the most convenient. I've been using something called Cardia Mobile, and I've got one right here. It consists of a little reader along with an app that you run on your smartphone. And some of these readers are built into smartphone cases. They've got a whole bunch of different ways that you can uh, carry it around with you. It's powered just by a little watch battery here in the back. And what you can do here is just tap on record an ECG. You put two fingers down on, from each hand on top of the sensor pads here, and it will start measuring your heart rhythm. Now, I am uh, busy working right now and talking, so this is not the ideal way to measure your ECG. You should be doing this when you're relaxed, but uh, you can see how this works. And what will happen is when I'm done with uh, running this test, what it will tell me is whether or not it thinks that I am uh, having an episode, uh, which I am not at the moment. Just again, if you're talking and active, it's not really the best way to record your ECG, uh, but it does provide some peace of mind. And I was really excited because they also offered a, and still do, a watch band for the Apple Watch uh, for about 200 bucks. And I thought, wow, this is a great and convenient way to do it. Unfortunately, though, in addition to spending $200 on the product, they also charge you $10 a month just to use it. And I felt like that was a little much to ask. So I said, you know what? It's probably just easier to walk around with the little uh, thing here and uh, not have to pay extra per month just to use the product that I would pay $200 for. But that's what they want you to pay for. So nonetheless, it's available uh, on the Apple Watch. But this is one product, I think, that will not last all that long uh, now that Apple has come up with uh, basically a way of integrating this technology into the product itself. Now, of course, all this great technology is important, but you really should go to the doctor if something doesn't feel right. Don't go out and buy this if you think you have a problem. Go to the doctor, have them do a proper checkup of you, and then this kind of technology will be helpful for managing whatever condition you're diagnosed with. Really seeing a professional here is important. I also wanted to talk about Inbox, which I was praising last week as a, a great email solution. Unfortunately, Google is getting rid of Inbox. They announced it the day after I told you all about it, and I feel kind of guilty about that. But uh, they have decided that in March, that is the end of Inbox. They've been rolling a lot of the features from Inbox into mainstream Gmail. And I'm hoping that some of the features that I'm using that are currently not in Gmail will make it over, uh, namely their ability to put different emails into buckets and have them rolled up so you don't have all this extra junk in your uh, inbox every day. I don't like their tab solution. I really like the fact that inbox would take uh, updates and forum posts and everything and put them into uh, a single inline uh, list of things on your Gmail that you could then expand out. Uh, that was really the, the beauty of how Inbox works, and I'm hoping that they will integrate uh, that roll-up feature into the mainstream Gmail and not uh, just offer the tab solution, which I never like. So we'll see what happens with Inbox, but it is dead. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 82 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And on Monday of last week, I was flown out to Silicon Valley in California for an event at HP about printing. And full disclosure, they did cover the cost of the flight and hotel. It was just one night, so I came in 
Uh, Monday evening, I stayed Tuesday and I was out on the red eye Tuesday night back to Connecticut. So you can imagine how I felt on Wednesday. I don't sleep very well on planes. I'm not afraid of flying, but I don't like having strangers walking around me all the time on the plane. So I just can't uh, seem to get a good night's sleep on the aircraft. But I went out there for a printing event and I'll be talking more about some of the printers that I saw there in the coming weeks, so stay tuned for that. As I mentioned a little a few weeks ago, printers are actually one of the most watched videos I have here on the channel, not by subscribers, but by people searching. Uh, so we'll talk about some of those new products in the coming days. But the uh, cool thing at HP headquarters is that they preserved the offices of Mr. Hewlett and Mr. Packard, and together they became Hewlett Packard or HP. I'm wondering how they figured out the order of the names. Perhaps the alphabetical order worked the best for them. And what's neat is that they built this really modern visitor center around where the two principals had their offices. So everything else is modern and fresh, and then their offices look uh, pretty much untouched from what they were looking like in the uh, 50s and 60s. And you can see what uh, one of those offices there look like. Uh, what was neat is that they had adjoining offices here and they had the door open between the two so they could shout at each other uh, throughout the course of the day. Uh, so that was, I think, Mr. Packard's office there. And uh, in Mr. Hewlett's office, they had a uh, little exhibit where apparently he had a penny on his desk and he was rummaging through his pockets and noticed that the penny was never taken off of his desk. And his secretary told him that uh, people were in such awe of him that they would never dare take the penny from his desk. So uh, he then encouraged visitors to drop off money on the desk there, and they've been doing that ever since. And I guess every couple of months they collect all the money and donate it to a local charity there. Uh, this is the conference room, which I think looks really cool. Nice retro look to it. Uh, and then we saw some other stuff that I can talk about. So this was the page-wide technology uh, that we did that video on a few months ago. This is their commercial printer, and this is an inkjet printer that is printing out this banner. It's just coming out very, very quickly. It looks like they were printing on uh, a vinyl surface there. And the way this page-wide stuff works is that instead of having a print head that goes back and forth, uh, page-wide just prints on the paper as it's flowing through. And you can print really big things like this on these commercial printers. Uh, the ink came off on his hand because it was a vinyl thing, but they also did some prints on paper and the ink was drying uh, pretty much immediately there. Um, there was also a little demo of what those print heads look like. Uh, these things are used, by the way, for printing uh, products, like you see those bottles on the table to his right there, uh, all those Coca-Cola bottles with the names printed on them. Uh, well, a lot of that packaging is made by HP printers using this page-wide technology, so it's given uh, branding people some really neat things to work on. And while I was there, I had some extra time, as little as it was, uh, to make some calls on some of our friends. So I stopped over at the Plex headquarters, which is uh, not too far away from where HP is located, and they uh, are working out of an old bank branch, and they've got a pretty cool office, as you can see here. I got there after hours, but this is what the inside of Plex headquarters looks like. Uh, they've got a bunch of people that work for them in California, but they also have people all over the world working for them, too. So it's a pretty spread out company, as like most of these uh, startups are these days. And they had a testing center on the second floor with a bunch of different configurations. Every time they're pushing out a new build, they have to test it on all this different stuff. They had a whole wall full of NAS devices, and then they took the old bank safe and turned it into a home theater room with these enormous subwoofers and stuff, too. So they uh, really do uh, a lot of testing in-house there. Uh, which is probably why you see so many updates on Plex. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And we were talking last week about fake reviews and whatnot, which uh, led to this question from Screen Playhouse LLC about how to properly disclose things on a live stream. Because very frequently, a lot of video game companies will pay these popular streamers to play their game for what could be hours on end. And uh, how does the disclosure work under those circumstances? So uh, you could, of course, just start off your stream by saying, uh, hey, this is a sponsored post, but that won't be good enough because if the stream is four hours long, somebody streaming in on hour two will not have heard that disclaimer. So the FTC has some guidance on this. They actually have a very helpful FAQ uh, that contemplates a lot of the different things that uh, people creating independent content might come across and they have a section on their FAQ devoted specifically to this topic and they recommend that you have a continuous clear and conspicuous disclosure throughout the entire stream. So you can maybe mention it every 20 minutes but if that's not practical maybe a little bug that pops up on screen that says sponsored by 
Epic Games, for example, if you were doing something for Fortnite so that people know exactly uh, what the relationship is between the streamer and uh, the advertiser in this case who is paying them to stream something. Lots of good stuff on this link. So if you are doing this kind of work uh, of your own, uh, definitely check it out because they even contemplate things like Twitter and Instagram and other places where you don't have a lot of text to work with. And they've got some really good suggestions for keeping yourself up front with your viewers. And our newest gold level supporter, Too Much Sauce, had a very good observation uh, based on some things we talked about last week about the seasonality of my channel's growth. So one of the things I talked about was that uh, over the course of the four years or so I've been doing this, that there were a couple of videos that hit the algorithmic lottery and led to a lot of channel and subscriber growth. And that really put me on the path that got me to being able to do this full time. And Too Much Sauce says there's a lot of dependency here, though, on a single source for revenue. And he's absolutely right about that because I am kind of at the whim of this algorithm or YouTube in general. If at some point YouTube decides that my content isn't what it wants to put in front of people, uh, things can go south on me really quick. And a lot of people on this platform have experienced that because even though uh, YouTube is not my only source of revenue. Uh, all my other sources of revenue depend on, on YouTube, essentially, and people watching the channel and finding my videos. If somehow I get uh, taken out of whatever is working here for me right now, uh, it'll all go down south really quick for me. Uh, but one of the things that I've been looking to do is put myself on more platforms just as a means of having a presence in more than one place than just YouTube. The problem, of course, is that YouTube really is the dominating force. And another thing that Too Much Sauce says here is that uh, there's just no competition out there for YouTube. And he's right in the sense that there really isn't a major competitor for independent content. And the reason is, is that YouTube is really the only platform that shares revenue as easily as they do. Even the new restrictions they put in place are not all that difficult to reach if you've got good content. And it's really quite possible for people to earn a side living or at least some spending money doing something they love doing and communicating it out to the world. It's really unmatched right now on any other platform. Uh, there was a great video on Creator Insider the other day um, that talked about some of the things that YouTube can do for people, even if you're not yet into the partner program. Because in the early days of my channel, uh, most of my revenue was coming out of affiliate marketing links, not from the YouTube ad revenue. And what kept me going was the fact that I was seeing growth. Uh, what also kept me going was that my videos were discoverable. And I think that is probably the biggest strength of the YouTube platform. Uh, because they are basing discovery on your interests or what you're searching on, not what your friends are looking at and suggesting to you like Facebook does. It's very unique in how YouTube presents content to people, and it works when it works, as it has for me uh, and many other people. And the reason why this discovery works and is so powerful on the YouTube platform is the fact that, as they announced in this video, there are 1.9 billion logged in monthly users on YouTube and that is why there is so much potential on this platform and why many people are not being successful in other places because those platforms just simply don't have the numbers uh, that YouTube has. 1.9 billion who are logged in people who are ready and willing to sit down and watch long form content. And that's a very significant number. And that's just who's logged in. You can have other people popping in who are not logged in that are searching on Google or maybe seeing something embedded somewhere else. So really the potential here is a significantly large global audience, more than any other network broadcast has probably ever achieved in the history of mass communication. And that's something really significant. Uh, the only platform that really matches them is Facebook. Um, and that's really the alternatives here are Facebook and Twitch. Twitch, of course, is a live streaming platform. They have a lot of good revenue options now that are emerging for creators to use. You do have to meet the threshold, but once you do, people can uh, help uh, grow your channel through direct contributions. I think they probably have some uh, kind of ad model there too, and it's a very good platform if you're streaming. Uh, streaming, though, is not something that interests me as a full-time occupation. I like to stream every once in a while here on the channel to reach out to all of you, but the problem with streaming is that when you're not streaming, you're not earning, and that's something that 
uh, is a little too much pressure for me, I think. I really like the fact that I can take my time with my videos, get them edited, put them up here, and have a platform where people can find them many years after I originally created them. Some of those printer reviews that I do uh, live in the search engine for a long time, which is so surprising, but they do. Now, the only service that has more logged in users than YouTube is Facebook, and they really could be the competitor here. They have a very robust video platform. We take portions of this show and put it up there every week. Uh, but the problem is, is that Facebook doesn't share revenue. So you do get some exposure and some reach for your content, but if you are depending on having ad revenue share as part of your ability to continue making the content that you do, uh, there's no reason to put it on Facebook because you're going to be giving views away and not earning anything from those views. And that makes it very difficult for me uh, to have any incentive to put my content from here over there. The weekly wrap-up stuff goes up after the weekly wrap-up content pretty much dies off on YouTube. So it's kind of another life to help brand the channel a little bit and maybe connect with some of you in different ways if you're not looking to watch a 35-minute diatribe, for example. But uh, at the moment, because Facebook is really picking and choosing who can earn on their platform, uh, there's very little incentive for me to put anything on there. Uh, what really upsets me is that I could put something on Facebook, they'll run an ad against it, and they'll keep all the money. And that's really not fair to creators, is it? So uh, they really could have a very, very competitive uh, platform to go head-to-head -head with YouTube, and they are choosing, for whatever reason, not to share revenue unless it's with somebody they reach out to directly or somebody they're trying to attract off of another platform. If they ever turned the switch on this and opened up the revenue floodgates, you would see very quickly a real competitor to YouTube, partly because Facebook's numbers for logged in monthly users are actually higher than YouTube. I think they reported about 2.2 billion last month versus 1.9 billion on the YouTube platform. So they could do it if they wanted to, but they are choosing not to. And as long as they're pocketing all the money for themselves, they're not going to get much content from me and many other creators. And this question came in from Jiv that was a follow-up to something we discussed a few weeks ago about how Windows 10 lacks a real lean-back television interface, uh, but it's something that Android is doing quite well with their system, which is why I prefer to use my NVIDIA Shield as my home theater device versus a NUC or some other kind of Windows computer. And one thing that Jiv suggested was maybe taking another look at Steam OS. We looked at it a while ago when we got in that Alienware Steam machine, but we really haven't come back to explore it since. And my big complaint back then was a lack of compatibility. But as it turns out, uh, Steam has been working on integrating Windows compatibility with their Linux client and are also baking that in now to uh, the Steam OS uh, environment as well, which is also running on Linux. So I think it might be something we explore again. Uh, one of the things we have here in the studio is Corey, who works for us here. Uh, his old computer's over there and not working. So we're going to try to get the computer working again. And this might be a fun experiment to run on it. We'll run Steam OS and run a few games and see how those Windows games perform versus a proper Windows 10 installation and see uh, where this might head. Because there's a potential here to really uh, make open source a little bit better. And the reason why this is relevant in a home theater discussion is that Steam has a very nice lean back interface. So when you're sitting at your couch, they present to you an interface that can be operated with a game controller, for example, and it also allows launching of other software in addition to games that are running in your Steam library. So lots to explore with this, and I think it's something we will uh, start messing around with and maybe do a live stream on when we have some more time. Uh, if you want more information about how they are running Linux games on Win or Windows games on Linux, uh, you can go to the link that you see here on screen to get more information about their use of Proton. Uh, to make it all happen. So we're going to be exploring that. And our Q&A for you uh, is whether or not you're doing this on your SteamOS installation or on Linux. I would love to get some feedback as to how it's working so far so we know what to expect when we get it uh, operating on that computer over there. So let us know down in the comments below and we'll start uh, doing some experiments and maybe have something to show you in the next couple of weeks. And our channel of the week this week is Studio Mud Prints. And I learned about this channel from another one of my favorite channels, Metal Jesus Rocks. So this is kind of a meta recommendation. Uh, Metal Jesus was reviewing a list of the best shoot 'em up games on the Nintendo Switch, and he brought in Studio Mud Prince to help with those recommendations because that is all Studio Mud Prince covers, is that genre. And if you're looking for some new games to play and are really fond of those spaceship shoot 'em ups, 
Uh, this is a great place to check them out, and I have been uh, pouring through this to find some additional recommendations beyond that top 10. I really love my Nintendo Switch. I'm playing more games on it uh, than I expected to just because it's so convenient. I've talked about this before. You can have it on the TV or immediately take it out and go into portable mode when all the other TVs in the house are occupied, for example, or you're traveling somewhere or whatever. I'm really happy with it. I'm going to subscribe to that online service so I can finally back up my save games. That actually has been limiting my desire to transport the Switch to other places because if I lost the Switch, I'd lose my investment in time in Zelda, for example. So I'm uh, looking forward to even playing more with the Switch on the road and channels like this are really good at getting some additional recommendations. He doesn't just cover the Switch, of course, but a lot of this stuff ends up on the Switch. So this week on the channel, I've got a couple of things planned. I am going to be doing a little more traveling, just a quick one, though, uh, over to New York City for the Pepcom Holiday Spectacular. Uh, this is an event I go to every year, and they do these about once a quarter in New York. A bunch of companies are all in one place, and I can get a good feel as to what is coming out for the big holiday shopping season. So we'll be on the lookout for cool, new, and unique gadgets and other stuff. So be on the lookout for that probably on Friday or Saturday. I'll be doing a quick summary of what I saw there. I probably won't have a dispatch like we usually do just because I don't have a camera person available, but I'll shoot everything with my phone and come back and give you my thoughts on everything I saw. I'm also hoping to get this shuttle review up of this uh, little Celeron-powered mini PC that's got the KB Lake Celeron versus the uh, Gemini Lake one we typically see. So we'll see if you get a little boost in performance for home theater activities and that kind of thing. I also mentioned I was going to kind of revisit my uh, Chromebook 101 video that's been doing very well on the channel. And a lot of what I did in that video about two years ago is still fairly relevant now. So I think the only thing that's new that I really didn't cover uh, was how the Google Play Store works, which I did cover in its early days, but I might come back to it and just do a little update on it. So it probably won't be a very long video, but just enough for people to understand how uh, Android apps are currently working on the Chromebook because that was really the one thing that wasn't out there for consumers at the time I did that initial overview. If you think there's anything else I need to do, let me know down in the comments below. Uh, Linux is probably not going to be one of the things I cover in that video just because it's something most consumers, at least at this point, likely won't do. But some of the other things that I might have missed uh, should probably get in there. So I'm going to put a link to the video that I did two years ago in the master playlist, and then you can let me know if there's anything else you think I should talk about. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, we get a little commission. We get a slightly larger one if you sign up for a Plex pass or gift it to somebody else. We also have other channels that you can follow me on. We have the Extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We have the podcast, which is an audio version of this show, as well as a monthly interview that I do, hopefully monthly. Uh, and you can also check out my Snippets channel, where we take portions of this video and put them into more search-friendly form. And we have my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live so you can see some of the projects we have done here on the channel. If you want to get notified anytime something happens, you can click on that bell and get sent notifications when we do go live or upload a video. So I suggest you do that and uh, let us know in the comments as a Notification Squad member. And we've got other ways to engage with the channel. My email list, which is very infrequent, at lon.tv slash email. We have the Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook. The Facebook group, which is nearing 500 members now, at lon.tv slash Facebook group, where you can interact with me and other viewers of the channel. A great place to do that. And we have the store where I sell things that I have previously reviewed here on the channel that are pretty much like new and they're available at a discount. And you can find that at lon.tv slash store. At the moment, there is nothing in the store, but I will be adding some things to the store shortly as we go through the rest of the stuff in the back room there. And you will get a notification if you want of whenever we do that uh, by signing up for the store alert at lon.tv slash store alerts. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Do keep those questions and comments coming down below in the comment section here and on my other videos. Uh, those things really do help guide me as to where I go next. And of course, if there are things you want me to review that I haven't seen yet, uh, also let me know down in the comments and I'll try to get to some of those things as the weeks progress here. Until next time, this is Lon Sivan. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, 
Gerard Newberg, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.